But most people say it the other way. No. Yeah. I don't know why they do, but very used to that. So. I will use the right emphasis. <laughs> I have a lot. Right. I'm German, so I'm going to start us right at one. <laughs> Any more minutes, but uh, it's my, most of you know uh, Shannon Spasova, mm -hmm. um, the goddess, who, <laughs> who is a professor in the in the Russian language program and a frequent visitor to CELTA and presenter in CELTA. And uh, because many of you know that, I just wanted to say a few things um, that many of you maybe don't know. Uh, Shannon is also on the board. Uh, of the IELT, uh, of IELT, the International Association for Language Learning Technology. Uh, she's also the webinar coordinator. So if you're looking for even more professional development. Or uh, if you know good presenters, or, or if you, know you would like to present, um, talk uh, to me. IELT, IELT has a monthly um, a webinar series, and it's free if you use the live version. You don't have to be a member or anything. So if you're interested in that, we have a couple of IELT flyers, I think, out here. Um, and, and um, yeah, and we're also, Shannon is also president of the Midwest Association for Language Learning Technology, and we'll have our conference here in a little less than a year, right? Do February 8th, 2020, so yeah. put it on your calendar now. Yeah, it's yes. just a Saturday here. It'll be right here. It'll be very inexpensive <laughs> if you're graduate students encourage them not just to uh, to attend but to present and it's a very cheap conference thinking. it will be here it's very friendly and so yeah. it's a perfect conference to have your first or second conference presentation at so if you're doing anything with language learning and technology definitely keep that in mind the call for papers will come out probably fall early yeah. fall yeah so a lot more professional development opportunities. I am excited to learn more about H5P, which I haven't used in a, in a year, and I just asked her, has anything changed? And she just looked like at me like, yeah. So <laughs> I'm excited to, uh, to hear. And I think active participation is encouraged, right? Yeah, so if you have a computer, um, you might want to try something on it. Um, I've kind of planned it to be sort of in between, that if you ha don't have a device, you don't have to try things, but if you do. And also, as Felix started to say, there's pizza. Yeah. So. If anybody's watching it live on Facebook, th I don't think they have a like pizza thing that it can go no, through the internet a yet. Virtual slide. <laughs> 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 so sorry we can't share through Facebook the pizza, yeah. but. All right. And I have to say hi to my grandma in case she's watching. Last time I did a salsa presentation, my grandma happened to right. see that and started watching. <laughs> so salsa is getting to grandmas now, too. <laughs> so um, I'm talking about H5P today, which is my favorite thing in the world, uh, maybe. Um, it's the best thing I've ever seen um, for creating online and tech-enhanced curriculum. There are so many different things that it can do. I'm just going to talk about two little small slices of that today. Um, and then also, uh, we're planning another H5P presentation in the fall. And uh, I want to know what people want. So I'm going to ask you that at the end if I don't forget. So anyway, uh, these authentic scenarios with H5P, I'm going to do a little bit of telling you what I mean by authentic and scenario in a minute. because it might not be exactly what you think. Um, I hope you'll find it useful anyway, even if it's slightly different from what you expected. So anyway, um, I teach Russian, and I teach first and second year Russian. And so most of my students are clawing their way through the novice level <laughs> and maybe starting to get to the intermediate level. But motivation on the novice level can be hard, I think, because everything seems so far away. 
Um, it seems like you can't do much. And in some textbooks, there seems to be this sort of lack of authenticity. And so I'm going to be talking about just a set of activities that I've created and I'm working on creating using H5P for people on the novice level that I'm calling authentic, but I put it in quotes. Why did I put it in quotes? Because it's really more of a mimicking of an authentic uh, scenario um, than authentic in itself. And uh, um, we'll s you'll see what I mean. And so it might not be everyone's cup of tea. Um, I don't mean authentic really in the sense of authentic materials, like something that you got straight off of the internet. And I'll explain what I mean, and I'll show you some examples of that. But my goals for these activities were to mimic authentic situations in a way that was approachable for novice level students, allowing them to imagine themselves succeeding in situations where they were using the language. Because that seems so far away for students who are um, on the novice level in Russian, that is a language that is either difficult or perceived to be difficult um, by students and also give them some scaffolding for things they can't actually fully do yet. And I'll show you some examples of that. So authentic is kind of in quotation marks. And uh, we'll see what I mean. So the plan for this is just me, for me to briefly tell you a little bit about what is H5P, show you some of examples of scenarios that I've developed in H5P. So but what do I mean by scenario? I mean, imagine yourself in a real life situation. Um, you'll see, I think, what I mean in a second. Um, I'm also going to tell you, Felix asked me, is there anything new in H5P? And the newest, biggest thing is a, an activity type called branching scenario. I've actually been using a different activity type that's called course presentation, and that's the bulk of what I'll show you. But there's actually a new activity type called branching scenario, which is kind of exactly for what I'm doing. And so I'll just show you briefly that. I've just only started trying to use it. And then we are going to take some time and brainstorm our own scenario. And then whoever has devices can try it along with me to try out the course presentation activity type to create a scenario. Or if you don't, you can maybe watch how, what it looks like as I do it. So H5P course presentation. H5P is this site here. It's just h5p.org. And it's a free, it's a way that you can make free online interactive activities. I'll just show you real quickly this page that says examples and downloads so that you can see how many different content types there are. Look at all those different things you can do. I'm just going to be highlighting the one called course presentation, which isn't even listed here. There are even more than are on this page. Um, and briefly mention the one called at the bottom. At the bottom. Okay. OK, there it is, course presentation. And then branching, briefly tell you what branching scenario is, which is one of the newest content types. And there are a bunch of really cool ones. Um, I have to decide what to highlight in the one in the fall. So I'm going to ask your input for that. So it creates interactive HTML5 activities, which what does that mean, HTML5? Basically, what it means is it's um, sort of the newer standard for making um, online activities means I hope that they will last longer than like a lot of the things we've been using have been based on Flash, which is going away, and HTML5 is the newer standard. It also means that as far as I have seen, H5P does a quite a good job of adapting to different devices and like what size they are. So it does a pretty good job of being mobile friendly and responsive, meaning that it responds to what size of device you have. Um, as I said, there are around 40 activity types, I think even more now. And the one that I'm going to be showing you mostly for this presentation is called Course Presentation. And it's a slideshow, sort of like PowerPoint, but it at allows you to add interactive elements to it. Um, and I, remember, I just remembered, I forgot to say that I have a cold and I'm on the mend, but I hope my voice will hold out. So, the first one I'm going to show you is um, an, a lesson that I've called a day in St. Petersburg. And one of the first things we do in the Russian class is teach the alphabet. Um, I have put the uh, URL to it here in case you want to try it yourself. Um, but I'll also show you some screenshots from it and just kind of highlight some of the parts of it. So after we teach, we, get, we do three lessons of teaching them the alphabet, the Russian alphabet. 
And then the fourth lesson is sort of a review and practice with reading the alphabet. And so all this, almost all the students have is just the alphabet. So they don't really have any vocabulary at all yet, because this is one of the first things they learn. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the students, when I was talking about um, imagining yourself in a situation in which you're using the language, what I wanted to do was imagine a situation that they might be in. And the situation that I thought of was they would be visiting St. Petersburg. And I wanted them to imagine themselves using the, this new skill that they have of reading Russian letters and getting around a day in St. Petersburg. And so, like I said, this, these are just some screenshots kind of highlighting part of it. Um, so a day in St. Petersburg, of course, the first thing you do on your day in St. Petersburg is you eat breakfast, right? And so here I have some breakfast foods with the, um, the words. And this is just a screenshot, so I can't show you. But the way it really works is that I would drag these to the pictures. And so it says yogurt. Bacon, omelette. So you can see how I've. It's not authentic in the sense that, of course, I had to choose ones that were cognates, which isn't a hundred percent authentic because there are different Russian foods that they're not familiar yet with yet that are maybe more common. So I had to choose ones that I knew they could sound out. So it's not authentic in that way, but I guess in my definition of authentic. It's at least that they're imagining themselves in a real life situation using that skill. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing they have to do in St. Petersburg. The second thing they have to do in St. Petersburg is a little bit of navigation of the metro map. So I made a screenshot of one part, a small part of the metro map. They have to find which metro station they're starting from and which one they're going to. So again, this is just all it is is sounding out, but it's at least imagining yourself what you might do in a real life situation. And then a little bit later in the day, they decide to go to a bookstore and try to buy a book. Your friend's looking for a cookbook, so you have to find the right section of the bookstore. Here we have culinaria, politica, biografia. So of course, I chose ones that were cognates. They have to find the one that's like culinary. Um, click that and it shows it gives them feedback. Um, your friend wants to pay with an ATM card. Are they accepted here? So then here I have a little sign that says the ways that how payment is accepted. And so they have to try to sound through those and decide, yes, our ATM, our bank cards accepted here. So again, it's, I, I have to be selectively authentic in that I have to choose things that I know that they're going to be able to read. Um, but I want them to feel successful in their, in their reading and feel like this is something I can do. Um, then they decide to get a ticket to a theater. So they go through some of the, um, I skipped ahead quite a bit here, but there's a section where I ask them to um, look at a, um, a list of um, performances and they have to choose the right one. And this is their ticket that they get, right? Um, and then of course they're hungry. It's uh, already lunchtime. So um, I give them some choices for where to eat. I tell them that they, they with their friends, have decided that they want to go to a Russian um, fast food place. So can you figure out which one's the Russian one? Because this one is what? Pizza, Pizza Hut, right? This one is Subway. This one is Burger King. Burger King. And here is the Russian one. So they choose the Russian one. I mean, obviously, you didn't even have to know Russian letters to figure that out. But these things are helping them along. Since this is very, very new to them, they've only just learned the alphabet maybe yesterday or something like that. Mm -hmm. These are in-class activities that you're doing? No, they're online. Oh, they're so you online. Online, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was actually, this particular one was developed for the Middlebury Russian School. Um, we have created a website that we call pre-immersion. If you don't know about Middlebury, it's a language school that where students take a pledge to speak only Russian for the whole summer. And some people do come with zero knowledge of Russian. And so we created a website that is supposed to help them sort of prepare for that. So if at least they have the, the letters, if at least they have some of the what we call survival Russian, they can uh, have an easier transition to the language pledge where everyone is only speaking Russian to them for the rest of the summer. So this was created for that to kind of prepare. But I've, I've been using it with my MSU students now too since we developed that. Um, 
so then I show them what it looks like inside this Russian fast food place, and we pretend we've gotten some food here. Um, and then, of course, what do you need after lunch? Well, maybe, but uh, oh, another thing. <laughs> toilet, right? So, like, of course, e that's really important, isn't it, to be able to find the toilet? Um, so I have these signs here where they have to choose the right sign. And then I am able to, I talked about how some of my culture is a little bit not quite authentic because I, didn't, I, I had to choose certain breakfast foods for it to work, right? But here I can work in some things about culture because here I talk about how in Russia there are like city bathrooms that you have to have 25 rubles or whatever it costs now, um, which sometimes is the best 25 rubles you've ever spent. <laughs> 50, oh my gosh. <laughs> The price has gone way up. But anyway, you have to be prepared for the fact that you need to, if you're out in the city, you might need to pay to use the toilet. And so I introduced this idea. So if they got the right sign of toilet, then they get to <laughs> the toilet. And then I do introduce a little bit of culture there, too. Um, they go to a museum. They match. So this is basically just a matching. but. I've just tried to kind of build a context around it, that's all. So this is just kind of simple matching, but it just makes it seem a little more real if you're imagining yourself in that situation, I hope, at least. Um, then they imagine that they're going to the theater, they go to a cafe, they look at some of these. So I do use some authentic materials here where like, I've gotten this from a website that's giving reviews for a cafe. And I, they have to sort of look at the, I choose, I pick and choose very strategically which one I'm going to show, something that they can understand. But um, they are, I am using some authentic materials within here. So um, that is the alphabet lesson. And then I want to show you a couple more, uh, some snippets from other scenarios that I've used. And again, these are, all of them are within the first or second year of Russian when they're really still on the novice level. This one, the clothing store, one that I'm going to show you, it's very, very early in their using of Russian. So what I ask them to do is imagine that they are working in a clothing store in Russia. So I give them a context. Oh, I should have put that in there. I give them a context of like a boss with a name, and I have a picture there. And so that's not authentic <coughs> in that it's not a real person. I've made up this person. But it's authentic in my mind in the sense that they're imagining themselves, do, themselves doing real life things. So they pretend they're working in a clothing store. And again, we just have a, here it's just, again, a glorified matching. But they're uh, imagining that they've gotten um, a truckload of clothes in these boxes here. And they have to match to the right section of the store. So again, I want them to feel successful. I want them to feel like there are things they can do with their language even though they're on a very low level. And then here they open the boxes, and they hear something from their boss about how many of each clothing item they should have gotten in the box. So all they have, really, all they have for this in doing this scenario is like clothing words, colors, numbers, and that's about all they have. But they have enough to hear a message saying, you should have gotten, I forget what this one is, but it says, like, you've got shirts here, right? You should have gotten eight shirts, and here you have seven. And so then they have a little checklist here where they say yes or no, whether they got the right number of things in that box. Um, and then they have to, so here I've used a, again, it, it, is an authentic, it, it is authentic in the sense that I have taken kind of an authentic interface. I've used a Russian mail program and done a screenshot but then made up a pretend email within it where they have to drag um, the numbers to the blanks here. It says, like, we should have gotten X number of shirts, but we got this number of shirts. So again, they don't even know how to type yet, which is why they have to drag and drop it into there. Um, but they know enough to at least um, fill in part of the blank. So he, they don't have enough language to be able to write this email themselves. But at least they can see the interface. At least they can see some of the conventions of how it works and feel like there is something that they could do with their language, even though they're on a low level. And then they have to um, text their boss about 
um, the email that they sent. So I, again, I have them, I, I made a fake, there's, there are some like simulators of iPhone text messages that you can do online where you write in things and it shows the iPhone as if it says it in a text message. So that's what I used for this. So I make a pretend conversation by text with your boss and then they have to choose the appropriate response to what the, the boss has said on the text message. Um, a, another uh, example here is I have them imagine that they are a personal assistant to someone. So here are some examples. Again, it's, um, this is from a, something like a Google Calendar, but a Russian version. And so they have to figure out where the different places go in this interface. A lot of it they can figure out from what they already know, from their kind of like real world knowledge. Um, and I feel like when you are coming into a new interface and it's all these words that you don't know, you might panic. But I feel like they already know a lot and if I can kind of activate that background knowledge that they have about, well, what is this probably? It's probably the name of the event. What is this probably? It's probably the date and the time. And they can figure out those things, but sort of mitigate that panic that could happen if you op suddenly open this Russian calendar program. And then just to sort of get them thinking about you know, real life in Russia, um, you probably had moments when you were in whatever country you were studying in where, where suddenly it hit you that this is actually real life. Did you, do you have any moments like that? Like, for whatever reason, for me, it was like watching game shows in Russian. I was like, wow, people are actually using that language to communicate with each other. Or like, or, you know, dogs understanding Russian, you know? <laughs> and I feel like maybe this can help create some of those moments even without, even before you go to Russia, that you're thinking, oh, there's a calendar thing, and they're actually using Russian in the calendar. So I'm trying to incorporate those in interfaces. So here they have to listen to what their, their boss has told them about her calendar and put some calendar events into her calendar. And so then I made it look like it was a real calendar. I took screenshots from the actual calendar interface and put them in there. And one of the cool things that this um, course presentation has is that it has a thing called, um, I think it's called Navigation Hotspot, where you designate a part of the screen, and then if they click that part of the screen, it will do something. So that is kind of cool because like, like on a calendar where you, when you click in the right time place, it will open something so that you can add in the event. You can make it sort of mimic that in this, in this uh, app. Um, the boss has a bunch of plane tickets. Um, that she wants you to, I think you have to write an email about the plane tickets that she needs to kind of make a record of where she had gone during, out, during the year. And so I made these fake plane tickets. What I did was I took a real plane ticket, looked at what was on it, and then I made these fake plane tickets sort of based on what the real one was. So these are not authentic, but they're based on an authentic Thing so that I could create the scenario. Because I'm not this woman, that's not my name, and I don't have six different plane tickets with different places and different dates. But I could make one based on the one that was real. And so then I had them fill out the calendar based on what the information that they had about those plane tickets. Um, li they listen um, for her, for their boss to decide what gifts to give her family members, just just some different um, and different kind of collection of activities. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to take themes that were in a particular part of our curriculum and then bring them together into one scenario. Um, and then the, I think this is the last one from this scenario where um, she the boss of this person has several employees and they have to each leave a voicemail about when they're available to meet. And so then that person has to listen to all of them and decide on which day they're all available to meet. And so again, this is just, this is very a very simple task, but it's just something that I've tried to build some kind of like real life feeling around, that that really is something that you might have to do at some point. Listen to what people say about when they're available and decide on what day everyone's available. 
Um, and that, so those are the sort of the, the end of my examples of scenarios that I'm going to show you. But I just wanted to briefly show you this new activity type called the branching scenario. So I, like I told you, I used the um, course presentation up till now. But now they have a new uh, activity type called branching scenario. And th I've just started using it. It just came out like a couple of months ago. And so here I have a new scenario where um, I'm teaching them how to go shopping in Russia. And what they have in the branching scenario is they have these what are called branching questions, which, depending on what you answer, sen could send you along a different route. So far, I haven't really used it um, to its full kind of ability. But what I have here is um, the person, what I'm trying to teach them that is that in Russia, if you change um, currency and you get too big of a bill, you're going to be in trouble because nobody's going to be able to or want to change your, your big bill. So I'm trying to teach them what can you say to get smaller bills when you change your money. Um, and so if they choose the inappropriate answer here, it's going to send them back earlier in the presentation and have them review something that was trying to get that information across before. Or it could send them somewhere else if I had created it that way. So here, I, if they chose the wrong answer, I say, wait, you might have trouble changing this bill, so you might want to try again. It gives that kind of targeted feedback. Um, I'm also trying to teach them about how to do things at supermarkets. So you have to print out, in some Russian supermarkets, you have to print out a price thing for the produce. And so I'm teaching them what that looks like. Giving, I created this screen that sort of looks like what they might have to do with the touch screen at the supermarket, showing them, you know, you, you choose vegetables, you choose tomatoes, and then you, and then it measures it out for you. And so I'm kind of trying to simulate what it looks like to do one of those tasks. And then here, I have some videos of myself. I should probably get Natasha to do it instead of me and take video of her. But so yeah, I'm asking some of the things that you might typically be asked in the supermarket, like, do you want a bag? Um, a bag costs 10 rubles or whatever it is, because this is something unexpected for students. Um, that here, we just automatically get bags at Myers and have millions of them at home. And in Russia, most people bring their own bags. And if you need bags, you have to pay. And so the supermarket interactions are quite formulaic, but they're unexpected and scary for students at first. So I'm trying to just get them aware of what it might be that people are saying to you at the supermarket. It might be that they're asking, do you need a bag? It might be that they're telling you how much a bag costs. Um, and so here, then I ask them to choose an appropriate answer. Um, and if they choose the wrong answer, it'll sort of send them back to an earlier spot in the scenario. Or um, it might, I also ask them, in Russia, they tend to want you to um, give extra money so it will round out what they have to give back to you. So those, like if, you're, if your total is 255 rubles, they might say, Will you give five rubles so that it will round it out so that they can give you 50 back instead of 45 or whatever? And so that's something unexpected to a lot of students. And so I just want to sort of get them aware of what it might be. So then this branching scenario, here's where they have to try to choose which money they should give and kind of get them aware that in Russia, they use these little, I don't know, money dish or something to put the money in. You don't. You, yeah, you don't put money in people's hands directly. Um, you put it in this little money dish. And so uh, and it's a superstitious thing in part. You're not supposed to put money directly in people's hands. I think that's bad luck or something like that. And so that might be something also unexpected. So I'm just trying to get them aware of some of these different things. Um, so here they're just imagining themselves in the store, what things that they need. And so I just wanted to show you what it looks like in the background of the branching scenario. You, these are all of the sort of events that are happening in the lesson. And my lesson right now isn't actually branching. If it were branching, what would happen is if they answer this, it'll go here. If they answer this, it'll go here. The way I have it is that it circles back to something earlier in the lesson to sort of review something that they must have missed. But um, since I've just started working with this, I haven't really sort of developed the idea of how to make it so that there are more, there's more than one branch. But that's how it works in this branching scenario, that if they choose one answer, it will go down one route. 
And if they choose another answer, it will go down another. So if you actually had it branching, then you would have one line going down like here and then ending, and then one line going down like over here and ending somewhere else. So it just depends on how you set it up. And so that's something kind of cool to think about for the future in creating these scenarios. So i um, just going to briefly tell you what are my steps for creating a scenario in H5P. What I've been doing is looking at the topics involved. Um, I've been trying to do one per semester or two per semester for 101, 102, 201, and 202. And so I'm looking at the topics that they have and trying to imagine what kind of real life situation could they use those skills in. So for example, like I told you, the clothing store one, I was thinking of like clothing words, colors, and numbers. That's all, that's all the topics that they had. So I was thinking, what could you use those topics in? Um, and then I find authentic materials that I can use to model something. So for example, a plane ticket. You can often find authentic things on the internet that give you an example of what it looks like. And then if you need more than one or if you need something different, you can kind of model and make a sort of, I don't know, semi-authentic one. Because like I said, with the plane tickets, I wanted her to be going to several different destinations to have several different ways to practice how uh, the students were listening to how sh they were saying get to that destination. I wouldn't be able to find the, the exact right authentic things on the internet that I would need, but I could find one and then make others that are mimic, kind of mimicking it, modeled off of it. And then I was trying to plan activities in each of these scenarios that used each of the four skills. So I was trying to at least incorporate a little bit of reading, a little bit of listening, a little bit of writing, and a little bit of speaking. Um, writing uh, in the very early ones wasn't really feasible because I had to wait until we had actually taught them to learn how to type. But they do learn to uh, type maybe halfway through the first semester, and they start slowly being able to type in Russian. So I did start to incorporate writing. And then the way that I incorporated speaking was that I have embedded voice thread activities. So um, I was trying to kind of include each of the four skills. And then I've been creating the presentation and the interactive activities within H5P. So far, I've been using the course presentation tool. And then I may start to use the branching scenario tool. So before I kind of transition to a slightly different thing, I just want to see if you have questions about what I have said so far. Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah, so H5P is, there are a few different ways to use it. Um, you can go to h5p.org and make a free account. and. You can put stuff there for free. The kind of caveats to that are, number one, whatever you put there is available to, to be found. There's, no, there's not really any way to search for it right now, but, but in theory, someone could find your stuff. So if you are sensitive about your stuff being out there, then you wouldn't be able, you can't restrict it if you put it there. Um, another caveat is that H5P says, that this is just a place to try it out before you put it on your website. Um, but they haven't really been enforcing that because I'll show you my account and how many things I have on there, and no one has kicked me off yet. So look at all those that I have there that no one has protested yet. Not all of these are like full things. Some of them are smaller activities, so it's not as much stuff as what it seems. But, but there's a lot of stuff there you can see. There's a lot of stuff there, and nobody has kicked me off yet. So I don't know if at some point they may sort of cut me off. So that's a, mm -hmm. what's, what's the actual stuff that happens that it's not living on their site anymore and it's living on your website? I will tell you that in just a, I'll tell you that in just a second. Um, and then the third caveat to it is that the things that you incorporate into your presentation, sometimes they have a size limit. So like if you want to include a video, the, this website does have a size limit for how big that video is. So um, there are a few limits on the h5p.org free account. Now I'll get to Amanda's question, which is, if you're not having it here, where are you having it? Um, there are a couple of 
choices for that as well. There are free plugins for WordPress and Moodle and Drupal. So if you have a website on any of those, you can install the plugin. I've been using it on WordPress, and it's free. So if you have a WordPress site that allows you to install plugins, you can install that H5P plugin for free, and then you can incorporate it into your website. Um, mm -hmm. But are you just talking about the embed? Like if you just move the embed no. code, then you're, taking, you're not taking the whole thing with you. No, correct. So um, there, there are t it's kind of complicated to, to explain, but um, there are a couple of ways to put H5P things into your site. One is by just embedding. And so if I go to this lesson here, which is something that I made for Middlebury, it's on the h5p.org site. And if I see here, I can just choose an embed code and have it embed into another website. So as of right now, that works fine. I just, I am a little worried that at some point, H5P is going to say, OK, you have 10 free things. And then other than that, they have never said that so far. Um, like I said, I have hundreds of things here, and nobody has made any limits on me. Um, if I want to put it on my WordPress site, I have to click this reuse, and then it downloads it as what's a .h5p file, and then I have to upload that file into my own website. So that's how it works um, if you want to put it like natively into your own. So that would make a new copy of what you've made. So for the most part, what I've been doing is I have been making them here, and then downloading them, and then putting like the final version up on a WordPress site. Yeah, Felix. Can you track students? <clears throat> Let's say they go through a branching activity. Mm -hmm. Can I track what the students mm -hmm. clicked on? And this is another complicated answer. Um, it depends on where it is living. Um, it, if you know what X API data is, um, H5P puts out X API data. So. Theoretically, it's possible to collect the information about what students are doing. However, you need something that can interpret that. And unfortunately, D2L is not able to interpret that at this time without um, some intervention by some of the tech people here at MSU. So theoretically, it is able to be put into a um, course management system that could collect the scores. But we don't have immediately right now the ability to do that. So, so far, I've just been using this as kind of self-learning, self-check. I wish I could get that information. And I know it is out there and leaking out into the internet somewhere. <laughs> um, because I've tried it in different, some other, and, and in WordPress, for example, if I put it in my WordPress site, I can see scores. If I had students that had user accounts on my WordPress site, I would be able to see what scores they have. But just having it in D2L embedded, I cannot see. So, so far, I've only been using these as sort of just self-check. Yeah, Rajiv. I, I'm wondering, um, because you, once I, I kind of heard that you can also edit the video, like you can have a YouTube video and edit that with H5P, is that? Mm. No. OK. So. Uh, the, the type that I'm showing you right now is called course presentation, and it's more like a um, kind of like a PowerPoint that has interactive activities on top of it. But there's also a, um, a present or an activity type that I have showed some people before, which is probably the one you're talking about, which is called interactive video. And what that does is it takes a YouTube clip or another type of video clip and puts interactive activities on top of it. Um, you can't actually edit video within H5P. All it does is it takes a video and then it sort of puts a layer on top of it that has interactive questions and interactive things on top. But you can't actually do any video editing within it. So um, my follow-up would be like, so how is this is like better than let's say hot data or quality? Because you can like branching thing you can do in quality too. Like you can it yes, and then it goes back to the yes side of it, and it no, then it goes to the no side. Qualtrics, I mean, I'm only slightly familiar with Qualtrics, but Qualtrics is really thought of more as a survey tool. Um, and it, I mean, it has some similarities in that you can make branches and things like that. But this is 
more for instruction. Um, and I mean, maybe there are some um, things that you could do in a similar way in Qualtrics. I'm not enough familiar with Qualtrics to. Yeah, a scary regime like it would be a workaround. Yeah, okay. So eventually it ought to be so done. Can, can a student take multiple attempts in doing that? Yes. Okay. And you, but we have no ways to figure out like how many attempts. That Correct. Okay. I mean, well, we it would depend on what you, where you had it living, but currently with C two L we don't have an ability to see. And if one more question. Yeah. Right, how do you incorporate that in your curriculum? Like, um, like, how often do you use it? Like, how do you fit that thing in your regular teaching? Because I'm I'm really impressed. I'm gonna try that. So far, I want to do it better. Um, so far, um, I have put it into, um, there, I have an assignment in my class that's called a choice assignment where um, I have different activities that students can do that have different point values. It's kind of similar to Felix's, if, you're, if any of you were at Felix's presentation about, um, what did you call yours? Game, gamification kind of. It's kind of similar to that, but just less snazzy because I don't have a cool um, package for it. But um, I have different things that, where students can do different things for different numbers of points. And by the end of the semester, they have to fulfill a certain number of points. And this is one of the things that they can do. One of the ways I can tell that they've done it is that they have to, like I said, I was incorporating um, voice thread into it so I can see whether they've done the voice thread. So that there's one piece of it that I can see whether they've done, which is, tends to be at the end. So I can sort of tell whether they've gone through the whole thing if they do that last piece. Felix, yeah? Cahoots just different. Cahoots seems like it's more for in-class like competitions or something like that. This is more for um, I, outside of class, probably. Yeah, Felix. Is there like a collaborative tool where like a team of, I don't know, everyone teaching 101, for example, can author these together where I would see, you know, single authoring as an individual instructor is mm -hmm. one thing, but if, you know, you have 10 sections of 101, it would make sense for different people to have access to maybe different modules that, mm -hmm. to, is, is there something built in there that you can work as a team where different mm -hmm. people log in? work on the same thing, make it better, but also kind of build a repository <coughs> that then different instructors can pick and choose what they want to do. Because mm. I could see that as really advantageous if you have a whole list of modules that you just kind of say, oh, this is mm -hmm. good for this class, and this is good for mm -hmm. that scenario. Well, so there isn't anything exactly like what you're saying, but I can imagine some sort of workarounds. So, I have never tried to work on the same project with another person. It's been only me using it. Um, and there isn't really an easy way to collaborate. I suppose you could share an account with someone and both be working on the same one. I don't know what it would look like if two people tried to work on the same one at the same time. That, that could be problematic. I have never tried it. However, one thing you can do is, uh, here's an example. And this one's an, actually an interactive video. Um, one thing you can do is if you see this reuse um, button here, um, this is something that you can either um, have on it as the author you decide whether that button is showing or not. And so if you have this button showing, then you can, like I'll show you what it does if I click that. It downloads it as an H5P file for me and then what I would have to do is I would have to upload this to my own like WordPress site or something and then I could alter it. So there is an easy way to alter someone else's work. So like if you, like if someone came along and saw this, this activity that I made and said, oh, I really like that, except I really don't like that exercise too, how she did it. I'd rather have something different there. Then they could do that if I allow, if I as the author allowed them to. But I'm not sure about how well it would work for like working together as a group. I've never tried it and I, I would be a little wary, like I would be definitely wary about both two people at the same time. You could probably share the same account. So, so was, was Felix talking, uh, maybe I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Were you talking about what if you had like six sections of 101? Could you share it among, not share it as in working on it, but share it so that all yeah, the students. Yeah, I think you can just. 
they're just all on the public site, right? Right. It, I mean, it depends on where you put it, but you can definitely embed the same one in different web, web pages. Yeah, so you could have this one, for example. In order to, sh to get this to show in D2L, all I have to do is grab this embed code. So if you had different D2L sites, you could still embed the same thing into all of them. Um, and then, Matt, you sort of reminded me that there was one other part of his question that I forgot to address, which was about like a repository. I think that H5P may be working on some kind of repository where you can search for different people's materials depending on how they're tagged. That is something that I haven't seen come out yet, but I have heard sort of people talking about that that is something that they want. So that may be happening in the future. I don't think it's happening right quite yet. But like internally, you could just set up a Google Doc and just kind of put all the links of all the tools that maybe a team creates. Yeah, and that's how I keep track of mine right now, is I have a Google Doc um, where I have a list of topics, and then I have my links to these different things underneath it. Um, I also just want to let you know that um, a colleague of mine from the University of Arizona and I got a small grant from the CIRCLE, which is at the University of Arizona Center for Educational Resources, I, something like that. Anyway, um, where we're setting up a website where we're going to house all of these H5P activities that I've done and some that they've done at the University of Arizona that's going to be available for teachers of Russian to be able to find things. Unfortunately, for now, our site is only Russian because we just th those are the we just had a small a very small amount of funding just to create a small website. But it's something that I'll, that could be done for other languages probably. So, um, I just wanted you to maybe brainstorm that if you were going to take a certain number of topics, and so the topics uh, that I'm, and this is what I'm working on right now, so I'm gonna like steal your ideas later. Um, but um, so if you had the topics of dates, locations, transportation, nationalities, and food, could you imagine a scenario that you could set up for your students that would incorporate either some or all of those? So I wanted you to brainstorm for me. <laughs> So with the branching scenario, can you have it? Can you have your choices and then have similar <coughs> follow-up questions for each of those choices? So yeah, I mean you can. Well, for one thing, you can you can copy things from one branch to another. So if you have one thing and you want it to occur in more than one branch, it's not that hard to have it do. But you can also have it circle back. So you could have it like a little branch come out and then come back and join the original branch again. Any ideas? If you're organizing this, so, you know, the context is you're, so you're broad, right? And you're trying to figure out um, uh, they're going to be in Russia for, for three weeks, and so you're going to have various dinners mm -hmm. you know, in various places maybe just in Moscow or St. Petersburg, and so the transportation, you have to get from one place, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. from one restaurant to another, but you know, from wherever the students are staying to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's your transportation, your food, your locations, your dates. Mm -hmm. I know you get nationalities in there. You're trying different styles of food. Perhaps. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. I think you either have planning, planning structures, planning scenarios like this. So if you're going to have dinner, and if you're going to have dinner, you're going to have or like you said, like the, the origin of the food, how traditional you want the food to be, that kind of thing. So planning scenarios, but then also problem solving scenarios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's so many things where if you look, I just keep thinking about the actual standards and the handy statements, and that you know my students right now are so into methods that are very anti-textbook and anti-thematic units. Mm. Thematic units are bad, and mm. books are bad, and so mm. you don't want these things that look like you're just teaching mm -hmm. a standard list of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so for something like this, if you look at the candy statements and you look at the descriptors, there's a lot about problem solving and being able to respond to an unexpected event. And mm -hmm. maybe less at novice level, getting up a little bit higher. Right, right, right. 
think of you know where they're going to encounter a problem. So they're in a hotel. There's a problem. Which of these problems is it? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. what are you going to do about the problem? And then what happens when you do that? What and um, do you know that they're that they're developing a new assessment for pragmatics? So Meg Malone is working with Julie Okay. Okay. Developing a new. I don't know that. Yeah, you know, but so yeah. it involves a lot of branching scenarios mm -hmm. and player characters and. Mm -hmm. and and so the whole idea of branching scenarios and using that mm -hmm. seems seems kind of hot, like a good way yeah. to make use of the technology right now. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, those are some great ideas, and that's really a good idea for, like I said, I'm focused on novice level, but you know, if you started to get more, a little bit higher for some kind of more problem solving type things, um, like real life things that happened to me, like my the shower door in my hotel room fell off, and you know, so <laughs> to do the situation with a complication, advanced level thing, you know, <laughs> yeah, I feel like. I could see a, a higher level class create these for a lower level class. Mm, that'd be like fun. Assign it to the students, because this is obviously a lot of work to mm -hmm. offer this yourself, so put that on the students, maybe even graduate students in a methods class. Or oh, that would be great, yeah. Think about certain things, about certain can do statements, and then they have to figure out mm -hmm. for the others, right? Uh -huh. Because as an individual instructor, creating like a branching structure takes quite a lot of yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. The other thing about uh -huh. a lot of these, as far as giving them credit for doing this, if you have something that has a specific endpoint, mm -hmm. different endpoints for each person, mm -hmm. then if they just submit to you whatever that endpoint is, whatever that final outcome is, mm -hmm. that demonstrates they went through the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can give them grading credit for going through the process, and you right. have, they have the learning experience that you designed for them mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they finished it. So you're not measuring learning at that point, but you are measuring participation. Right, so yeah. Well, I'll show you what I came up with for this. Um, um, I came up with the idea that and there's sort of similarities to what Matt was saying. Um, and this one isn't done. I've just started it. But um, I'm pre we're pretending we're organizing a conference. And so here you can sort of see what this actually looks like, because this is not a screenshot. This is the actual thing. But so here um, you have to, I don't even have the audio file here yet, but um, there's going to be an audio file that you have to listen to your boss saying which events will be on which date. And so then they have to drag the right date to the right place in the schedule. Um, and then here again, uh, here are some locations. So where is, this is the conference program, where is, in what place is going to be, they listen again um, to where something is going to be, and so they have to drag the right place. Um, and then here's some, trans here's some in incorporation of transportation where some of the speakers at the conference will get picked up, and so I have these fake emails that I've written that says like when, and again it's dates, I'm going to arrive on this date uh, by this transportation means, um, I need someone to pick me up. Uh, here or there, and that also gets in some locations. Um, similar thing there, similar thing there. And then here's where the uh, nationalities came in, Matt, where I've got different people coming to the conference from different places, and they wanted to room with people from their own country. <laughs> I don't know, that seems weird, but maybe. And so you have to listen um, for who is from what country and then match them with their roommate. Um, so that's where, they're at, that, where that came from. And here's where I haven't gotten to the next part yet, but um, how many people want X or Y from the menu? Um, or English speaking student asks which things on the menu are vegetarian. Uh, so here's some of the ideas that I've had that I'm still working on developing for the end of this scenario and getting some of that other, those other skills involved with speaking and the writing. Rajiv? I think other scenarios that I was thinking maybe I was spy. A spy, woo. That sounds like a fun kind of game you could create. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for, for students, like maybe they, they like this idea. Like I, I did do this in a habitual, you know, many ways. Like no, so you are spying this report what that person did today. You know? Right. Yeah. No, that would be fun. That would be a fun game. Profiling, the, profiling someone and seeing them act and say, "Did you do the same?" Uh huh. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it might be a way, I mean, the branching scenario might work really well in that they go down different paths depending on what clues they have or something. That would be, that would be complex to develop, but it would be really fun. Like, how hard is it to embed an audio file into something like this? It's easy, and let me just show you, just because we only have about five minutes left, but let me just show you sort of a little bit about what it looks like to create these course presentations. Um, so if I click edit here, we can see what it looks like in the editing. Um, so I have like a palette, which um, you can see the different slides here. And the ones that have like circles on them are the ones that have some kind of interactive element. So this one has a what's called drag text. And so if I double click on this, you can see it gives, I have to have a title and like a description. And then here you see that the things that are in stars are the things that are draggable. And so you put in stars what you want to be able to be dragged. And then it just sort of interprets it that way and puts it at the bottom here, or depending on how big I make it, it might put it to the side. But um, uh, so that's what it looks like to make an activity like this one. And does the same design mm -hmm. as what you're doing if you are doing outside the branching scenario? Like you create them separately and then insert them in So this one is actually this one is actually not the branching scenario. This one's called course presentation. So it's basically slides with interactive elements on top. But the branching scenario can include course presentation within it, okay. if that makes sense. Okay. So a course presentation can be inside a branching scenario as one of those elements. If you want to be fancy, you can have a lot of input for them at a certain point, and then they make their decision. Right, yes. You can have a whole bunch of different stuff. Like, I can show you what it looks like. The, I have only have one branching scenario so far that I've been working on. Um, but I will show you what it looks like when I look inside of it. Um, I gotta think what it's called. Here it is. Um, so this is the only branching scenario I have so far. When I open it up, it comes with this map that is showing where the different branches are going. But then when I click here, it has, this is the course presentation that's within it. And the branching scenario is like a tree structure. Yeah. Yeah. So I can include all, a lot of the same things or all of the same things that I can within this course presentation. Um, let's see some other examples. That's another of the same kind of drag and drop. You can see here I have put text. Oh, no, it's an image. I put an image, but I've made it display like a button so that then it doesn't come up unless someone clicks it. And if you look at my palette here, you can see a lot of the different things that I'm able to include. So there's text, I can put a link, I can put an image. Ooh, shapes, that's new. Um, that's exciting. Um, a video, this is go to slide, which is kind of cool. Um, it means that I designate part of the screen and then if I click it, it goes to a certain slide. So I can, I can sort of make a branching scenario within this, which is sort of what I was doing before they had that branching scenario. Here's audio. So you can just upload some kind of audio. It doesn't have like a recorder within, but like you can just use Audacity or something like that and use whatever audio you already have. There's fill in the blanks, which is really easy to do. Single choice, which is kind of like multiple choice. True, false. Drag and drop, which is basically like where you have images that you dr drag to blanks, things like that. Um, like, the, like the breakfast was a drag and drop one. Summary, and what else do we have here? Drag text, which is kind of like drag and drop, but it's just text. Mark the words, which is basically you click on the right answer. You have text, and then whatever's the right answer you click on. Um, dialogue cards, which are kind of like flashcards. Continuous text, which I don't know. I've tried it out, but I can't remember. Exportable text area is I think where like you would write a small essay and then you could export it to be sent as an email to your professor or something like that. Uh, a table, an interactive video you can put into the course presentation and, and a Twitter feed. So those are all the different things that you can incorporate into the course presentation. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to kind of try it out or um, for me to show you how to make it, but um, I want to tell you that 
Felix said that I was the webinar, that I'm the webinar coordinator for IELTS. And IELTS, for IELTS, I created a couple of kind of tutorial videos about how to make course presentations and interactive video in H5P. And so if you are interested in looking at those videos that I created for IELTS, you're welcome to email me at spasava at msu.edu and I can send you the links to those tutorials. I forget if they're 10 or 20 minutes long, but they're just kind of a quick introduction to how to start working with either the course presentation or the interactive video. And then I just kind of wanted to get a, some opinions about um, for next fall. I'm kind of torn about what I should present on for H5P. Um, I mean, branching scenario seems like the new hot thing, but I I'm not sure how many people are going to be using it. Um, interactive video or course presentation might be more popular. Um, I could also present on there are a couple of really cool new ones called Speak the Words and Dictation. Speak the Words is one that uses automatic speech recognition um, to evaluate what students say. Uh, dictation is one where there's an audio file that students listen to and they have to type what they heard, sort of like a dictation. Or I could also present on activity types that students could use themselves to produce language. So I just wanted to see if there were any preferences. I'm having a hard time. Can come from the direction of what this is really useful maybe to develop in learning. Like a lot of things are practicing, practicing vocabulary and practicing some, some structures and mm -hmm. like you said, the dates and numbers and things like this. Um, but like you've done work on digital literacy and what your learners need if they're going to be able to use the internet for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if you came from that direction and said, how can we use this to teach digital literacy because I can use the internet. And so and back to kind of what Rajesh has looked at with early literacy and that's something that would be parallel across any of the languages that have a different writing system than mm -hmm. the Latin alphabet. Then you could look at it, you could come from that direction and combine mm -hmm. it with the other things that mm -hmm. Okay, think about that, that, that possibility. Any other, uh, I just don't know what to choose. I remember there was a presentation on those cartoons that um, created. Um, you had like cartoon characters? Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, uh, if there could be any follow-up on that. I can't, I'm trying to remember what you're talking about now. <laughs> Which cartoon? Was it years ago? I think it was, I don't know, maybe a couple years ago, and that's why I probably asked us. I'll have to think about which thing you're thinking of. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I, I did do a presentation on that. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> oh, I was just curious about the speak the word course. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Especially the speak the words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, so everybody, for listening and for some great questions and good ideas that I'm going to be stealing right away. <laughs>